I'm playing a new deck today. So this is post the most recent patch, uh, like one day after, I believe, I don't recall the exact changes. You know, it's not going to be anything uh, anywhere near the size of the open beta patch, but some things were changed. I think most notably uh, armor, the armor archetype was nerfed a little bit. Uh, and besides that, I'm not really sure. And then like <laughs> not related to the patch change, uh, Swim, you know, did what Swim does and he <laughs> revived an entire archetype just by being a good deck builder. Anyway, so I'm playing this uh, kind of like mid rangey kind of control Aridin. It doesn't pack much of a punch, but it does kind of have uh, I'm kind of using this almost like to practice like uh, my more macro. Like uh, overarching strategies instead of more mac micro strategies like you'd see in something like Armor Henselt or maybe like Dagon Consume. So this deck relies very heavily on using uh, basically just, you know, in general control options. So I have lots of weather. I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six forms of weather. And generally speaking, I want to try and get m most of those going in round one without getting passed on too early because that will allow me to. You want your weather to, to take as long as possible, and that's most usually in round one or in round three or if you're controlling round two. So I need to do I need to fall into one of those situations. Now, one of the ways I'm going to be doing this is by using my summoning circle to copy his spy and place it over on his side of the board. So he wanted to kind of have like an easy out in this round or for, or, um, or force me to make a misp misstep by playing something like this four strength uh, wild hunt hound and then falling too far behind the tempo or whatever it is or over committing to a round that he's not going to play anyway. If I play a weather, he can just pass and it's like a weather clear. So I go ahead and I use Summon Circle. I even up our cards once again. And because it's the same string spy, he can't just automatically pass. He doesn't. He definitely does not want to automatically pass. Because if we go to round, effectively round three, with like 11 cards left, I will always win that because I have so much weather. Unless I catastrophically misplay by, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, like stacking all of my weather all at once and then getting it first lighted. But I wouldn't do that. So the very first thing, I'm going to be using my Wild Out Hound to start playing that weather down the range row. Or not range row, but seed row. The purpose of this is to start getting these some damage on these guys. And also I have my weather set up so that if I want to drown or something to that, that row, which is not likely to play anything else on, I will be able to take advantage of that and get double synergy. Okay, I'll see this up. Oh. A little bit. So basically, the next thing I'm thinking is that I have a drowner. Uh, so this is kind of one of those one of those opportunities where you can know how a combo will work out without actually having to think about it. Uh, in other words, so I know drowner. Drowner is a very powerful combo because I know I can play it down on a row. I can drag a unit to it. It's going to do four damage to it, and then it's going to get hit by a. Uh, it's going to get hit by the weather and do additional two damage. So long as there's not a unit on the row that ends up being lower so effectively <laughs> the point that i'm trying to say i can hit i can instantly kill a six strength a six strength unit if i drag it to a uh a weather row a frost row because it's going to be damaged so much in the process of moving it because you not only get the two damages from moving it from drowner you also get an additional two from moving it to weather, and then you get an additional two because it hits hit, gets hit by weather. Of course, this doesn't always work out. Sometimes they have like a one strength unit. Sometimes they have another two strength unit. But in general, you can probably set yourself up so that you can kill these six strength units without too much issue. And the cool thing about that is that a lot of cards in the game are, are a lot of the combo cards in the game are around six strength. Like think about uh, re uh, actually revealed milk card kind of bucks that trend. They have a seven strength, uh, whatever it's called, Monganel. But then you go to like Discard Skellige, they have those six strength warships or whatever they're called. Other factions like uh, Northern Realms, they have siege supports that are six strength. So by using Drowner and Weather, you can effectively kill these big combo pieces without waiting too long. Because obviously he's going to like uh, scale exponentially in tempo by having two of these out. Because next time he plays like one, two or three spies and all of a sudden it's going to be like five strength, like 30 strength. Right. And then obviously I can't play into that and I lose my advantage. So I need to kill these guys as soon as possible. And also I want to get my tempo up. So I'm going to be playing Aridin here. 
and making sure to pick the navigator because navigator is not only additional strength but it uh will thin out my deck and take out a wild hunt hound in a weather in doing so because i don't want wild hunt hounds and weather uh you know bronze weathers in my deck going into later rounds i want my good cards that i want to draw into so you want to try and get these out these wild hunt hounds out pretty relatively quickly at least two of them i think around one is fine anything less than that and you risk uh having bad hand so he goes for a really really risky play here this is something i don't actually advise you doing um but i i kind of get the feeling he's trying to force me out of this round really quickly he's trying to get as much value as he possibly can out of these spies that he played on one one single turn and he did a pretty massive swing here but still i know i have two weathers there's no way i'm going to lose this round so i just need to play it out a little bit more I, I know this is six strength, so I can immediately kill it if I bring it to the row. Now, I didn't bring it to the siege row because it might not kill it. And this is going to die anyway. So look at it this way. If I bring it to, to the siege row, I kill one unit. And then it kills the other unit next turn. And then this will fall to two strength, and then it'll fall in the next turn as well. So it's one, one dead this turn, and then two dead next turn. But I want to be able to kill two of them on this, on this next turn. So I'm going to drag this here. This is going to go down to zero, and then that's going to go down to zero, and then he only has one left that will go down to two the next turn. So it's the difference between killing one on one on the first turn and two on the second turn, and two on the first turn and only one on the second turn. If that, if that makes sense. <laughs> the point of that, I'm trying to get both of these down to two strength and kill both of them at the same time. Now that effectively his combo pieces are gone and I still have two weather, I basically just won this round by this. <clears throat> Excuse me, by this point. There's no way you can keep playing into this. He, he just lost this round. He's lost, he's lost way too much. And now that he's committed such big combo pieces and haven't hasn't really gotten a whole lot out of it, uh, he, he's basically kind of SOL by this point. The best he can do is play these Impair Brigades and maybe some other shenanigans, but for the most part, I don't have to worry about too much. Now, of course, I need to use the Drowner because I want to get something into that weather. It's going to do the four damage. I'm going to pick Impair Brigade <clears throat> instead of the Spy. Why did I do that? Did I have any particular reason to? Actually, that may have, that may have been a poor choice. Because if I I do have uh I am running Igni and Scorch in this deck. So I should have kept Impera Begin on its own row and then move the spy back. So that's a bit of a mistake. I was thinking I was thinking I, I would keep Impera in case the round goes long, I was gonna keep Impera Brigade on that back row because it'll guaranteed tick every single turn. As opposed to the spy, which will uh fade out at a, after six turns, but I should have played more around the Scorch and Igni. Or played around drawing into Scorcher Igni with uh, Gale is here. Oops, I'll just speed this up a bit. Wait, uh, <laughs> I didn't even press play. Okay, so he's playing the infantry out. He can't really do a whole lot. He's gonna set up these units so they can get hit by Impair or Nazika Brigade, but I don't really care. Uh, there's not a whole lot of use uh, for this guy. Actually, I think this this Wild Hunt guy is actually surprisingly weak. Uh, even at his best, like at his very best, he's just an 11 strength guy that happens to do a little bit of disruption. I don't really like this guy. I think he's too weak. I feel like if you manage to like either kill something or have weather on the board, I feel like it should be boosted more. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say because like if, if this card sees a buff, then it could see... It could be overbearing, but playing it right now feels weak. In general, this deck feels kind of weak, but it's kind of interesting. That's kind of like an, uh, <laughs> a funny little thing. It's almost like, you know, back in Naruto when, uh, <laughs> when Rock Lee had weights on him, right? It's kind of like what this deck, play, playing this deck feels like. Like I'm putting intentionally putting weights on myself. And then, you know, when I actually go and play a good deck... <laughs> The weights will come off. Wait, how did that happen? Oh, that's right. right. Uh, so John Calvate, uh, this is kind of an interesting thing. John Calvate does not count as a gold card. Additionally, uh, gold cards played from John Calvate don't count towards the the roach trigger. That's 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 the kind of mistake you make like exactly once, <laughs> and then you never do that again. You have to be really really careful when playing Nilf guards. Uh, draw cards like uh, Vilgefortz and Rainfarn and Yakim and things like that because you absolutely do not want to draw into Roach. Roach is 
the absolute worst you can do because you not only lose uh, the Roach's ability to naturally trigger off some other gold card, but you also draw into it, not drawing into something else that's much, much better. So it's really unfortunate that he drew into that. So I don't, I don't, uh, I go ahead and use my mage here. I'm not really predicting gold weather. Although what's funny is that gold weather is almost non-existent now. I made a video like two weeks ago where I was like, man, there's so much gold weather. You know, I was running into like two gold weathers almost per game, right? Uh, Ragnarog, Ragnarug, and Drought. But now the, the mages have seen a bit of emergence, both in Nilfgaard, Skellige, and what, whomever. The mages have seen a bit of a rise in popularity, uh, popularity as well as First Lights and Control Aridin. So uh, gold weather has been pushed out a little bit. It's really interesting. I like that. It's kind of like like that didn't that wasn't something that was necessarily affected by patching. That was something that was affected simply by or more so by community uh, uh, steering, I guess, steering. You kind of steered away from using gold weather because the emergence of mages, which could first light those away. And then if we uh, if we ever go back to a meta in which mages are not as powerful as other silver cards, you will see the same thing happen where gold weathers will rise in popularity once again. Also, it can also be a very it can be a thing like uh, if the like popular decks in particular just don't have very many gold cards, very good gold cards, then they'll just use the gold weather instead because those are pretty effective value, uh, especially if you, you can use them right. And they're very oppressive. So I think that's why, like, when Skotal was really big, they Gold Weathers also went up because everyone was playing Spellatal, Skotal, and Gold Weathers were just a natural inclusion because their gold suck, or not necessarily suck, just not very good. At the very least, not lending to any particular archetypes very well. Not like in the uh, the case of Nilfgaard, which I think is the most well designed faction in the game. Is it the most well-designed action in the game? That's definitely top two, I think. Next to maybe... Mm -hmm. Maybe monsters? kind of like monsters. Who knows? So this is kind of an issue that I'm ha I'm running into with Gales. Um, and kind of like... Like a two-part kind of issue. One... <laughs> one... Uh, Gales is significantly worse if you don't know what cards are left in your deck. And if you don't know what cards you have, if you don't know what cards are left in your deck, you're probably not running a deck tracker. So Gales is significantly worse because you're not running a deck tracker, right? And I don't want to run that stuff because um, why don't I run that stuff? I don't know. I just don't really feel like it. Uh, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of subscribed to the idea that Life Coach brought up, where you're a worse player. You make yourself a worse player by relying on deck trackers and like, so I kind of avoid using and also, you know, it keeps track of all your stats. Which can be kind of like, oh man, I've lost 20 games today. What the hell? I suck. But if you kind of, if you don't remember it, it never happened, right? <laughs> That's the kind of a side rant. But anyway, so uh, Gales is kind of, can be a little bit difficult to use because I don't really know what I'm, what the chances of the cards I'm drawing into are. Uh, so I kind of <laughs> effectively like, Okay, so I know I run Igni and I know I run Woodland Spirit. Do I need either of those right now? And then I don't even like bother trying to remember what silvers are still left in my deck. Uh, it can be really bad to try and draw into like a Roach or something in Gales when you have like no other choice. Like, you know, if it's like the choice between Roach and uh, a dead Igni, it can be difficult. But anyway, so I, I knew, I knew uh, he had a big unit on that range row that I wanted to take care of. And I went for the the Igni play because uh, I knew I knew it was still in my deck with Gales, but it can be a little bit risky. I don't really like that. Uh, that's actually kind of a a weird thing. Gales is <sighs> Gales is such a weird weird thing because it's so there's a like a lot of inherent RNG associated with it because it's not like Royal Decree, right? Royal Decree guarantees you get to pick your gold card out of your deck, or something like Reinforcement guarantees you get to pick uh, a unit out of your deck. Gales is kind of like a combination of both. You don't get to, or it's like the combination of both and then like divided by two. <laughs> you get access to a gold card. You get access to a silver card, but you don't, you don't get to pick which one it is. You do, I mean, you get some choice, but it's not a choice in those particular uh, branches of uh, uh, card type. It's a weird thing. 
Especially if you want to use Gales like draw a spy or something. It's weird. It's really, really weird. And it kinda, I kind of dislike uh, Gales inherently because of that. And by the way, when I said earlier I was going to move the Impair of Gate to the Siege Row because I knew... Or because I wanted to um, get as much value off of that as possible. That's exactly what's happening here. And also, you may be thinking, uh, and I thought this was relatively strange too, why is he playing out this round so long when he doesn't have a whole lot of uh, synergies left, right? I took out his Imperial and Forces early, and he doesn't have a whole lot of options otherwise to try and come back from that deficit, right? Because that's a huge blow. You kind of almost want to just reset the round and try and go from there and make some different decisions and not, you know, be hurt. kind of uh, reset your losses or whatever, shore up your losses your weaknesses and um and that's in that round but he kept playing it out because he knows i'm playing this control Aridin. he doesn't want to go to uh round two and three where i control it because that'll mean i can just uh bleed him out as much as possible with weather and if he doesn't have any options to uh you know counter that weather he's gonna be just stuck and this is kind of like an, a pretty big issue um i probably did so well i probably did as well as i did in this round and i did it as well as i do in general in rounds if I go second, I always want to go second. One, because it'll allow me to play reactively. And two, because it'll allow me to play my Frost on the a, a better row because I'll be able to target uh, a unit instead of putting on empty row. And three, because it'll allow me to play low tempo plays like Wild Hunt Hound and not be punished for it. So uh, actually, I'm thinking I've, I've been losing a lot of games today. And I feel like this deck is relatively weak. I think it may actually be because I'm going first and then I'm not passing. I think I should do that. I should start doing that. If I'm going first in a round, in the first round, I should just pass. I've seen it. I've seen it done before with some pretty good effect. I think I'm, I need, I need to try that out. Maybe even keep like a a separate win list, a win rate for that. Like going first. But see, you're you're like just just by the virtue of losing that coin flip, you're just at a disadvantage that you can't really solve, or that you have to take a lot of pain to overcome. Uh, feels bad man and just like like otherwise like you may be thinking well why don't you just not play wild hunt hound there right or something like that wild hunt hound is the core of this deck and a lot of the units around it play around it like uh drowner the wild hunt warrior and um you know some of the other cards they all kind of play around weather and play around wild hunt hounds being able to get those out and also in general it just makes your deck a lot uh, thins out your deck which is always good Oh, not always good. It's good for the situation. So I go ahead and play out my spy here. And the off chance that he had his spy, uh, that would have been kind of bad. And the off chance that he had his spy, I mean, in the chant, in the situation. That's what I was trying to say because he already played a spy. In the situation in which he may have still had a spy in his hand, he would have gotten to play it for free because he would have been. Uh, actually, no, it, he would not have been able to play it for free. Wait, yes, he would. Okay, yeah, 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 I got it mixed up. He would be able to play that for free because he'd be still one strength up. And when he uses Peter to buff up that uh, Frightener, I'm thinking I can take this round by using Scorch. And this is a really interesting thing. Uh, so in the first round, I was just kind of generally explaining the deck, some macro, you know, situations and a little bit of rant. Uh, this is where you kind of get into some real, some really like tricky mind games that you can't really teach or learn all that well. You just kind of like run into them and then you make note of them. So this is a particularly noteworthy event in which my opponent didn't expect me to be able to come back from this point. So now what you're thinking, right? So break up your hand. You have a Scorch. You have a Drowner. Which one do you want to play first? Do you play Scorch and instantly get that 15 strength out of there? Or possibly wait for a bigger strength total like uh, Tibor? Or do you play Drowner, which is a little bit safer? You're not really waiting on any synergies. It's kind of just a basic card to go forward with. So in doing so and thinking through that process, you're going to use Drowner first. Drowner, just to reiterate why you're doing this, Scorch can Scorch is always going to hit that 15 strength, uh, at least the 15 strength guy, right? For the most part, at the very least, it's going to hit that. It can, on the off chance, it can possibly hit something like Tibor. Tibor is 25 strength. You're going to hit 10 more strength, right? Drowner, I am not waiting on any synergies. I'm not waiting on uh, Drowner to be better. Drowner is as good as it's going to get at this very point in time. So Scorch only gets better. Drowner is as good as it is right now. 
So you play Drowner first. And doing so, he's thinking there's no way he can do 12 strength with one card, right? Or in the off chance that I do, in the off chance that I do, he loses. Or in the off chance that I don't, and he plays his last card, he loses. If he plays his last card, then I'm going to be one card up going to round three, and he's going to lose anyway, right? So he's going to take the gamble. This is so interesting because this is like, this is... It may not seem like it, but this is kind of like a high level tactic that he's kind of going for high, a high level tactic tactic in the sense that he's playing to win, not playing not to lose. If he played his last card out with this uh, relatively high strength total difference, he would be playing not to lose because hitting 12 strength uh, with my control Aridin, that's pretty unlikely. He took a pretty safe bet passing here, right? He thought there's no way this control Aridin, which plays a lot of low tempo plays over a long round, is going to be able to pass that strength. Even though the safer play would be to play his last card, he passes anyway because he's thinking, again, playing to win, he wants to win the game and not just not lose round two and go into round three and then lose anyway because he'll be one card down uh, under me. But, unluckily for him, I do actually have a way to punish that and I'll win by three points. <laughs> but it was a really good play. Like I don't disparage that at all. I totally would have done the exact same thing. You can see a lot of a lot of games where I do do the exact same thing, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It's just a gamble you got to make. Which again is why Gwent is so incredible because you can do things like that. All right, so that's it. That's cool. Know how? Actually, I don't even know what to call this video. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. It's probably just gonna be self-titled, like Control Aridin or whatever. Thanks for watching. It's a neat deck. I think I would recommend if you're trying to practice uh, like overarching like three round strategies to play this Aridin deck as opposed to something like I don't know, whatever. Like Spell a Tau, it's a little bit more micro-intensive. Thanks for watching.